This is MSCI Perspectives, your source for insights for global investors and access to research and expertise from across the investment industry. I'm your host, Adam Bass, and today is June 10th, 2021. Today, we've talked on this program before about the impact that advances in technology have had on investors across the spectrum. How today, we can do things faster, more efficiently, and at much lower cost than ever before. But a big part of what makes that possible is moving process and data into what's known as the cloud. And also, moving from a mindset of, I me mine, to one a little closer to come together. Sorry, big Beatles fan. To help us understand this new paradigm, we have two guests today whose career paths have both centered around the power and the possibilities of technology. And those career paths have now intersected. My name is Roman Kuzmenko. Uh, so I've been with MSCI for over 15 years, actually 15 years and eight days to be exact. I started on the 1st of June uh, in 2006 as an intern. And right now I'm responsible for the uh, uh, MSCI data science research team, which is part of a broader research and product development organization. Uh, and cuts across all MSCI product lines. And also joining us is... My name is Dania Kure, and I'm a recent joiner to MSCI. I joined uh, from Microsoft, where I spent the last five and a half years. Uh, but I've had an overall 26-year career in uh, the technology industry, um, mainly focused on internal IT, business-focused IT, and industry-focused IT. As a recent joiner, as she put it, I asked Danya to share her impressions of the investment industry in terms of how tightly it has embraced technology as a whole. Here's her response. Yeah, so what I've seen in the investment industry is you have, you know, the traditional, very sort of a conservative industry, uh, not very keen on taking on a new technology changes and a bit reluctant to change because it there's a lot of risk that comes with change. But at the same time, I see this as an industry that's being disrupted. So we see the emergence of the, the newer types of investment tools out there with the millennial generations sort of touch, attached to their phones, doing everything on their phone. For example, Robinhood. Right? Uh, if you look at kind of what Robinhood has disrupted the investment uh, world entirely, and, and it made it uh, a different on how you actually place trades and uh, and invest, but also made it directly tied to the handheld devices that we take everywhere with us. And I see, you know, in parallel to that, the rise in computing capacity, AI being embedded in a lot of the investment tools and methodologies that we're seeing. So, so in the sense, yes, uh, the investment industry has been forced to adapt and absorb all of the new technology innovation because of the disruption that's coming from the some new new emergent uh, players in the space. Fair enough. Roman now, with his 15 years and eight days of investment industry experience, he didn't disagree, but he did go on to cite some of the internal forces that are driving this disruption. So I think that there has been uh, tremendous changes uh, in the past 15 years uh, or so that I've been in this industry. Uh, it's been uh, quite fun to keep up with them uh, and try to stay ahead. To me, what really stands out uh, is in this period is the democratization of uh, the data science stack. In case I'm not the only one who wasn't clear what a stack is. So by stack, we just mean uh, the whole ecosystem of, of the tools that uh, make up a, a platform. And so typically uh, in, uh, in a data science kind of stack uh, of, um, of these days, you'd find like hundreds and hundreds of packages and technologies produced by different people that you can kind of combine to create um, uh, the whole platform. And so you could have in there packages to slice and dice data, uh, apply machine learning as examples, or even simulate uh, a, a strategy um, going back 10 years, something like that. And so technically, we, we've seen a huge shift, I think, from expensive uh, proprietary software we used for data analysis to uh, an open source stack. This stack now is available to anyone to build on, and this, it is free uh, kind of in, the both, in both meanings of the word. So both uh, free 
in terms of licensing and also free to extend and and build upon and secondly so given this kind of uh, this this uh, this world of more and more data uh, the second aspect of this evolution is also human uh, where whereby the data analysis and programming skills are kind of becoming more and more of a basic skill and there's an emergence of um, uh, and it's a word I like uh, of what is called nowadays citizen developers so the, this refers to people that are familiar and know how to use data analysis techniques and tools but whose main job or even education background is not software engineers that reminded me of something Nicholas Grouse from ARK Invest mentioned when he joined us earlier this year. He spoke about how there's no need to start from scratch anymore when it comes to programming. There are bits of code that you can literally copy and paste. Now, Nick was talking about the trajectory of a bullet in a game like Fortnite. I assumed Roman was not, but asked him whether the concept was the same. Uh, absolutely. So it's it's it's. Uh, I think it's a trend in general in technology, where basically things that uh, once were considered kind of difficult and were specialized um, over time become a commodity and like a building block to build uh, something something else and something new. Basically, you have these kind of building blocks. You can think of them as kind of Lego bricks, and then all you do is simply you combine them in um, in a way that is useful to showcase what you want to achieve. So it really takes uh, very little code to create such an interactive experience. And perhaps an example for, for us is that we, uh, in, in the data science team, we're uh, developing what we call MSCI apps, which allows us to uh, very rapidly provide an interactive experience uh, that we can expose to, to clients or publish on our website thanks to this, these kind of building blocks. So there's a number, for instance, of widgets uh, around the user experience that you can simply reuse uh, to build some interactive experience in a matter of, of hours uh, and, 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 and not days or weeks, uh, as was used to be the case in, in the past. The rise of cloud also gives you the ability to do things that are low code. You used that terminology a lot when I was at Microsoft. They're sort of free program components that you can reuse and customize, but some of them are really apps. So Microsoft has this power platform, and if you've looked at it, you can actually design an app for your device very, very quickly and uh, without having like highly sophisticated programming skills to come with that. Uh, you know, if you're a business analyst or, you know, a researcher, you can build a visualization dashboard in Power BI, or you can use Power Apps to build your own web app on, on your iPhone or, uh, or other sort of handheld device and, and take it with you. And, and there is that ability to do that now with more of these technologies that are emerging as well. And, and Microsoft, not the only one that has that. Other companies are doing the same. So far, we have an industry being disrupted by external and internal forces, and huge potential from computing power that's not only advancing at a nearly inconceivable rate, but is also easier for more novice and even non-programmers to use. And most of this is possible because of the cloud. It's changed how companies across sectors operate, even the sector that created it. The entire engineering process to build software had to, had to adapt to the cloud world as well. You know, you hear a lot about waterfall methodology being sort of the traditional software delivery process that's been left behind years ago, even before cloud emerged as the destination for a lot of the compute that's being created. Waterfall methodology is essentially a software development process that flows steadily and sequentially through a series of steps and, importantly, only in one direction. That's opposed to a more iterative or agile process. But in addition to just move, becoming more agile and more nimble in the execution side of building software, a change in how software is built and deployed has also been introduced by the cloud's technologies. So there's this rise of DevOps. Now we talk a lot about DevOps as, as uh, the product, but really DevOps is a fast on-ramp of new software to the destination. So you take a, a new uh, piece of software, you want to take it from conception to 
deployment to the into the user's hands, and that that is the process by which you be, do that more effectively and quickly. Also, how you design systems has changed. Um, you no longer have to do all of this complex provisioning of infrastructure ahead of time. Uh, the way you budget for it is different because now you know you just have to provision a piece of infrastructure in the cloud, and then it's a monthly price you pay versus an upfront capital expenditure that you have to uh, um, allow and budget for. So overall, from a system design and engineering, the process has shifted and changed, but also on the technology itself. You know, scale in the cloud is not really a problem. It becomes a, a, a much different conversation uh, than before. The, the biggest advantage, I would say, is automated scalability. So when you build an app for, for the cloud, you can really start small. And as your app um, gets used more and more, there are ways to make the underlying infrastructure scale automatically without having to purchase all this hardware um, from, from the get-go. Another advantage of a similar technique is that if your if your app, for instance, is used uh, a lot more during the day than during the night, or in a global context, probably it's less relevant. Um, the system allows you to scale down and up resources as the client demand evolves. So that's something that um, that is much more difficult to do on prem, uh, where you would need to to basically to acquire your maximum capacity upfront and always target this maximum capacity. Now that's incredible. So it, it it's not only scalable in the sense, like you said, that you only pay for what you need as time goes on, but if I'm hearing you correctly, it's it's dynamic even over a 24 hour period. Is that is that right? Absolutely. And so not, uh, for example, during weekends, you can typically spin it down. Uh, and all this can be based on a, on a fully automated set of metrics. So you define your threshold uh, for scaling up or down, and the system will adjust the whole thing automatically according to the to the load. So it, it is not even just user based. It's it's almost process based. We we call it elasticity actually. So you you're elastically scaling out to the needs of your user demand if you're dealing with users accessing an application. But the elasticity also has to do with compute. Um, give you an example. When I worked in energy, we had these very very large models that you know seismic imaging models that we would run on these uh, specialized compute hardware. And those spe the specialized compute hardware is very expensive. Uh, but these models don't happen uh, often. You don't run these models frequently. You may do a project, you spin up the, the clusters you need for a few days, maybe a few weeks, and then you shut them down. So you get that elasticity. And sometimes even within the day, you may have one or two uh, algorithms that you want to run for a point in time to get an answer. And in that case, you want to scale your hardware and infrastructure to support that algorithm. But then once you get your answer, your calculation is done, you shut it down, and then you don't have to pay for it. In the traditional sense, and, and kind of going back to my experience in the energy industry, uh, when I worked in BP in, in 2015, you know, we had a special built hardware called the High Performance Computing Center that we built and designed for, for that use case. And, you know, it was... It was sized to a certain point. It was fixed in its dimensions. There was expansion capability that usually would, you would expand in one direction. And when you bring in new models and um, new studies that you wanted to do, they sat in a queue. And so it limited the business and how much they could do at the same time because you had that sort of fixed capacity that you can handle. And then the hardware was leased in three-year cycles, so you would get the latest hardware and they were always kind of refreshing it, but it was also limited in time. Today, if you're using Azure, for example, or AWS, you, um, you have the ability to size your infrastructure according to that particular problem. So if there's a new research opportunity and you find you wanted to go investigate, you would run the model you need for that period of time, get the capacity, run the model, and then release it back. And then uh, if you don't need it anymore, you're not paying for that infrastructure long term. And more importantly, your models can become more and more sophisticated because now you can have access to new hardware on a very, very regular refresh cycle as well. It was starting to sound like the possibilities are endless, which is exciting, of course, but also a bit too conceptual. 
it feels like a good time to talk about a concrete investor-related example. As an example, perhaps we, we recently developed, it's still kind of in testing internally, uh, a small app to get clients' feedback on how to simulate a um, uh, a portfolio trajectory towards net zero. So that's, that's around climate. Um, and so in the past, we, we, we would kind of build PowerPoint decks, uh, then go to talk to clients uh, with them to get their feedback. But here we can just share basically a prototype of an application very rapidly, which is interactive and with which they can play with uh, and adjust different parameters and see what happens to get feedback uh, a lot more quickly. Let's let's define quickly here. How how long would the process be start to finish in the old way? And how quickly were you able to build and release this tool today? Sure. So in the in the old way, it would be fairly cumbersome because typically you would need to require to request um, uh, new hardware uh, and then configure it, request databases and what have you. Uh, before you can even start kind of your 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 app development, here in the new way we uh, we use a cloud provider to deploy our apps to. So we have a very simple way for researchers that don't need to know anything about the underlying infrastructure. They just focus on the uh, um, on the logic of the app, and then there's a way for them to push it, and then it becomes instantly available on the cloud. And then we have a controlled process, of course, to push it uh, and make it available externally. But that's more about um, about governance rather than the the, the technology. Uh, so all in all, you can build something like a simple app in, in a matter of hours on the data science platform. Building an app in a matter of hours. Amazing. And also necessary in a world where people are constantly on their phones and able to access information in seconds. I was left wondering, though, about one big reason some firms may have trouble moving away from on-premise operations and proprietary software. Why they remain, as Danya put it during our interview, server huggers. One word. Security. Are there security concerns by working in the cloud? Well, of course they are but uh, they're not that different from the ones you have uh, on on-prem. And secondly, typically the cloud providers uh, would um, uh, would employ much larger security teams that um, look at how to uh, establish the best security practices than any kind of single company um, such as ours uh, would do on their own. Uh, then of course it doesn't uh, remove the need to have governance and controls um, on how you uh, someone exposes uh, different services on the cloud so that these are secure. But overall, in terms of securing kind of the infrastructure, updating the systems, patching uh, for the latest vulnerabilities, a cloud provider is is better equipped uh, thanks to scaling scale um, uh, scale benefits than any given company. So security is not a concern only for the cloud. Um, and it's not really a concern that happens when you start moving to the cloud. Security is a concern you carry forward, whether you're having applications in your on-premise data center or not. Uh, frankly, there's no difference. These cloud companies have spent millions and millions of dollars on ensuring that their cloud environments and platforms and data centers are highly secure. But it's also you as the provider. It's still your responsibility to ensure that your applications and solutions that you're de developing are secure. We used to talk about this um, uh, as a defense in depth. It's a common terminology used in, in security um, across all industries, but it, really it's the idea that you want to secure your perimeter, you want to secure your system, you want to secure your networks, all the way down to the actual data sitting uh, in the storage array or, or, or on disk that you're trying to uh, ensure the, the consistency and security of that data. What you want to do is say, assume that you're going to be hacked, assume that you're going to be breached and build in addition to the security layers, build in the ability for you to quickly detect when a breach has happened and be able to shut it down fast. So that's the other side of it is you build observability. Uh, you build alerts and validation and um, all kinds of layers of 
um, detection into your products and and uh, and suites. And when you're using the cloud, that is part of the framework that you have access to in a cloud environment, especially if you're using platform as a service tools, pass tools, because they are designed to help you detect uh, breaches and, and inappropriate access as well uh, as part of the way they're building the, the cloud platforms. So overall, in, in a sense, it's actually easier uh, to be safe and secure in a cloud environment than it is on an on-premise environment where you could have blind spots. What became perfectly clear as I spoke to Danya and Roman was that we are past the idea that there's a choice here. It shouldn't come as any surprise either. From our discussions around smart cities to the tech revolution in China and all the way into the metaverse, it's clear we are soaring into the cloud at an increasingly rapid pace. The choice at this point is about how specifically to put it to use. And as each interview drew to a close, I had to ask, what's next? So, so I don't know if that is necessarily next, Adam, because it's growing in parallel as a sort of separate space that is converging, but I don't know if you're paying attention to what's going on in the IoT space. Um, that's also emerged very quickly. So we went from the control system, complex, isolated, and requires highly specialized skills to manage to this internet of things. So now we have compute and, and sometimes cloud scale compute at the edge uh, that is bringing data and computation and models and algorithms directly to where the data is being collected. So in a sense, it's also creating this entirely new space with smart cities and uh, see that in the manufacturing space, like um, the smart factories, um, the also in, in uh, consumer devices like AR, VR, and even like self-driving cars. The AI tech um, capability requires a lot of compute. What we're seeing is that the compute is also shrinking. So it can be at the site of data collection and be able to also connect with the cloud so you can do the training and, and sort of the bigger things that require the massive clusters. But those two together are almost like two poles of one continuum that uh, that is will be transforming our real life uh, very quickly and, and at a rapid pace. And to be honest, it's really difficult to predict what kind of what the needs will be in the future. Uh, I'd say that most likely it's going to be something that will come as a surprise to us. And so the important thing is being ready basically to react and, and adapt to changes quickly. That's all for this week. Our thanks to Roman and Danya and to all of you for listening. If you like what you hear on Perspectives, please don't keep it a secret. Subscribe leave a rating, leave a comment. We would love to hear from you. Until next time, I'm your host, Adam Bass, and this is MSCI Perspectives. Stay safe.